I can't believe that one virus could do so much damage. So many patients are dying and they're so young. It's getting really hard to be here. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. It's just an awful feeling. For the first time, we have an enemy unfamiliar to everyone. Throughout 2020, healthcare workers saved millions of lives from COVID-19. But they also witnessed thousands succumb to the pandemic in front of their own eyes. You might have seen clips of chaos rippling throughout hospitals around the world. But what happens to healthcare providers when they clock out? How does a person cope after watching one of history's deadliest pandemics from the front lines? I virtually followed six international healthcare workers as they work through peak moments of infection in their communities. They documented their journey daily and give us a personal view of what the pandemic was really like for them, both personally and professionally, as they fearlessly risked exposure to the virus around the clock. When coronavirus hit, I have never, ever in my career seen so many people close to death, unable to breathe, requiring oxygen. Time to leave the hospital and go home. So it's been like, you see your first patient come in. They're a young, otherwise healthy person. They are seeing that they're very short of breath, but when you look at them, they look okay. And then slowly in moments, even over the course of an hour or two, you start to see them decompensate and you are wondering if you need to actually put them on an actual ventilator to help them breathe. And as all this is happening, you have patient number two coming in, which is like an older person who can't breathe and you need to make sure that you help them like right now before they lose a heartbeat. As you're doing that, a third person's coming in and they're having the exact same thing going on. And you can't believe that one virus could do so much damage in so many different ways. Some days are worse than others and it hits you and I'll call up my mom and I'll cry and I'll call up my dad and I'll cry and just tell them how much I love them and tell them to just take care of themselves and to be safe. Ever since COVID, the way I've been getting ready for work is drastically different from what I used to do. Um, <sighs> this disease is scary. You're constantly thinking, what's going to be coming through the door next? Whose mom is it? Whose dad is it? Whose cousin is going to save them and keep them in their family? Will my luck run out? Will I get sick? It's crushing. It's killing. And it's just... <sighs> You just got to keep doing your best, I guess. That's, that's it. I remember I was telling my sister about how no one was protected. I kept making a joke, you know, we're all going to get it, we're all going to get it. And then I woke up one day with a cough. I thought it was another cold. It turned out to be a whole nother monster that I didn't know would shake me to my core. If I went through the process by myself, I probably would have died by myself on the couch. Without my mother, I, I couldn't move. And here's my madre. I am a registered nurse, one of the frontline workers. I've taken care of different type of pandemics, epidemics, but I've never seen where it has taxed the medical profession so much, but to be able to take care of your family member and do it from a distance is the most difficult part because there were times when even her personality had changed because I can see where she was beginning to give up. Thanks to God that we have made it this far and she's improving day by day. Now her biggest fear is going back to work in that environment. It is scary going back. It is scary. It's scary going to work every day. Not knowing what you're facing when you're going back to work. Yes. 
I get exposed to 15 patients a day wearing the same mask that should have only lasted for one patient. And I'm reusing all of these things that should never have been reused. being anonymous. Our current institution has a very like tight media policy. It would jeopardize my entire career. Six, four. We have now even more young people than we did before and you just kind of have to not get emotionally attached to them because if you do it will destroy you. There's just like no way you will survive this pandemic if you care for each patient the way that we usually do. Your heart will just be shredded. While PPE is what's making it on the news as everywhere about what we need, and it's true, we are reusing N95s, we are reusing disposable masks, we are reusing face shields. Shortage that we're seeing extends to medication. No one could imagine how much supplies we would need for something like this. morgue is completely full. We've had to just kind of start storing bodies in refrigeration trucks. It's just an awful feeling. It feels so bad. I just have this like knot in my stomach. In Tuscany, we really were scared because we understand that this virus works very quickly in the first days. in that moment because you know that the patients you have they have the COVID but you don't have it. Be very sure that when you go at home you are clean to hug your girls, to hug your husband. Ready to go home, but they called me because one of the lady is breathing badly, and I ran inside to see what is happening. And she died. I just talked with his the son. He couldn't stay at the phone. I'm running at home because my husband is at work now. He has the night guard. The girl. Ciao, bimbe. <laughs> El hospital está absolutamente desbordado. La gente espera días abajo en la urgencia a ser ingresada en, en camillas improvisadas en medio de un pasillo. no está cogiendo a pacientes mayores de 65 años. Entonces, pues bueno, durante la guardia viví una situación, la verdad, eh, que me pareció de las más impactantes que había eh, experimentado nunca y es que un compañero y yo fuimos a, por las diferentes salas de observación para ver eh, qué pacientes estaban malos o creíamos que no tenían posibilidades eh, de salir adelante para sedarles. Entonces, eh, estábamos haciendo esta ronda de la muerte realmente, porque no se puede llamar de otra manera. No tengo mm, palabras para describir el horror. Y la verdad que salí devastada. We don't have a medical staff that we need for the amount of people that are hospitalized. Supposedly we're under quarantine, but basically you go outside and Tijuana is running around like nothing is happening. 
I don't think people are really respecting the quarantine. And that's basically because um, they're in need and they can't stop working. I mean, their job is in the streets. It's definitely scary and it's definitely, you know, frustrating. It's sad, you know, the situation because most of them don't even have a home to go to. So you ask them to stay home, but their home is in the streets. So many patients are dying and they're so young. It's just, it's just shocking. It's just been harder because there's just so much of that that we've been seeing and our own colleagues have fallen. I also found out another one of my coworkers is positive that works in the same ER as me. I know him well. So that's another thing that's been on my mind the past couple of days. And when anyone hears that she's a nurse, it's always like, oh, this really could be me. Today I broke down and I felt cloud of emotions. It's really common that most of us feel really guilty. I mean, some of us don't live with our family members anymore, but some of us do and we're still entering the COVID areas every day. I'm just replaying and playing in my head the constant just worry of my parents passing away, of other people's family members passing away. It's really hard, um, but you find ways to cope. Outside of their hospitals, the world has pretty much shut down. And as they battle the unimaginable during their COVID shifts, the majority of us have stayed inside for months now. But essential and frontline workers like them were also under quarantine after work. They too had to balance family, roommates, isolation, and come up with different ways to decompress or entertain themselves, especially during their peak weeks. I think just as a physician in general, you see and deal with so much reality. So you find kind of your outlets. I think everybody has something that they do that makes them happy. And for me, I mean, I think it's a variety of things. It's my family, it's my friends, it's dancing. I dance a lot. I enjoy Bollywood dancing. My mom's birthday is coming up soon. And so I'm kind of sad. I'm not gonna make my mom's birthday this year. Happy birthday! I need to stay away from my parents. I don't want them to catch anything that I might bring from the hospital. Hello. Hey, my mom decided to cook some lasagna tonight, so let's see how this goes. You're burning yourself. <laughs> you can tell it's our first time. <laughs> We're all at home. Leah is doing the tiramisu. I'm a mom of three girls, and my husband also, he's a doctor, and he works in the emergency department. And how was the dynamic with both of you working long hours at the beginning? So this really changed my, my way to be a couple. He moved, he slept in the other room. But fortunately, we really work it in different turns. When I was in the morning, he was in the afternoon. 5 p.m. we have the lesson from the school. Here we are with the computer waiting for the teacher. I was living with my parents and I didn't want to put in danger of my family. So I had to move. My biggest sacrifice obviously was not carrying my nephew or not, you know, hugging my dad or my mom. It's day 11 with no symptoms. I called the health department today to schedule for another test. I need two negatives before I can go back to work. I've been prolonging scheduling because I'm scared of getting infected again. We've never seen anything like this before. Every day, the way you take care of these patients changes and there's new data coming on, there's new things you consider and there's new things you check. There's still so much we don't know. There's so little that we do know. The more we talked, the more I noticed how the uncertainty of this pandemic, the long working hours and the staggering mortality rates were weighing on healthcare workers like them, emotionally, physically, and mentally. Son las dos y media de la mañana. 
no he parado en todo el día no puedo más estamos dándonos cuenta del de vacío tan grande que sentimos dentro nos sentimos tristes, nos sentimos solos nos sentimos impotentes it just hurts to see all the different stories of families being torn apart by this virus it made me very emotional thinking about how I survived and there's still people out there that are dying and wondering what made me so special that I was the exception the mental toll I think is going to start hitting the physicians now that the pace is slowing down a little bit in other states. Today there's articles all over about one of the New York City ED physicians who committed suicide. Dr. Lorna Breen, an emergency room doctor at New York's Presbyterian Hospital, took her own life. Dr. Breen survived the virus, but it was the grueling work, her father says, that took a grave toll. You just can't believe it. You're like, this can't be true. And then you slowly start to realize that it's true. And then there's just this sort of emptiness that you feel inside and you you want to check in on everybody. You want to make sure that everyone's okay. The hope is, is that that continues and that we're aware of mental health issues and that we're aware of these struggles. Do you believe that depression and PTSD is going to be a pattern for those who were on the front lines of COVID? Yes, I think that we've just seen a lot. There was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of just horrifying situations. Although they would witness the hardest days of their professional careers, they would also witness kindness around their own communities. All these boxes are donations from people from Tijuana that got together. Muchas gracias. A las ocho. Todo el mundo sale a los balcones a aplaudir el trabajo de, de los sanitarios. Y la verdad que eh, nos emocionamos cada día. Can you hear the cheering? Can you hear the cheering at 7 o'clock? It's so sweet. It always makes me well up and want to cry. And it just reminds us that we're all in this together. We're going to get through this together, New York City. <laughs> I think now the main question isn't so much does quarantine work? It works. But now what? It's not practical to keep humans locked up in their homes and rooms for the rest of their lives without any social interaction. So it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, Georgia's opened up, a couple of other states have opened up, and as much as I believe that it's not going to go well, it'll be interesting to see how things pan out. I only hope that people stay safe and that they're okay. been a year, a hectic year, but we got through it. Some people haven't been able to get through it, but the ones that have, we got through it. I was very hesitant at first to get the vaccine, and I was very scared. I don't like to admit it, because as a physician, I get scared that I'll say that, and people will automatically run for the hills and will not get the vaccine. And that's not the message that I want to put out. But, but I just want to say that I was in the same boat as as um, everybody else. When a new kind of vaccine comes out that we've never had before, you're going to be hesitant, you're going to be scared, and that's okay. And the way that I got past that was that I started looking at the data closely, started talking to my colleagues, and started talking to my friends who had been involved in the process or knew someone who had been. That's how you did it. I did get the vaccine 
in December, I got COVID about five days after I got the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, which sucked. Well, I probably was exposed before, so luckily I had a very mild course, potentially attenuated by the little bit of vaccine I had and whatever few immunoglobulins my body had managed to produce over the course of that five-day period before I got infected. I'm glad I did it. I don't want to get COVID again. You know, and I had a mild form and I will do anything again to not have that again. We did get a bump in COVID patients, but nothing nearly as bad as what it was in March and April. So I can just only be thankful. Something big that we learned over the last few months taking care of our COVID patients is that it seems that our PPE when used correctly works. In the beginning when we would just wear the non-rebreathers with the blue masks on top, with the shields, I was, I was so worried that that wouldn't help us, that that wouldn't protect us at all. I'm at a COVID site. This is where I work. In Florida, our positivity rate is 7.5. We add 5,000 plus new cases every single day. I swab noses for the Florida Emergency Management and we average about 1,300 cases per day. Our numbers are still increasing and this is the end of spring break for us. And Miami Beach is the worst where they've had to put restrictions and they've had to put curfews at 8 p.m. because things were so outrageous. People were congregating, having large parties with no mask. And we're expecting our another surge to be coming soon. I do plan on working at a vaccine site um, that's starting to roll out again for the younger individuals. It's been a year since I've been working with COVID patients. It's also been a year since my daughter came down with COVID. I don't know if I've built up antibodies, immunity. I don't know, but I still feel that I need to wait a little longer before I can make that decision about taking the vaccine. I remember getting my second dose and walking out of there feeling just this new hope and new breath of fresh air and I felt like the birds were chirping and it was sunnier outside and it was, it was incredible. Twenty twenty was considered the year of the nurse and they actually saw they needed nurses, that we were appreciated. Nursing has truly been underappreciated. We give more credit to the doctors, and it's actually a nurse at the bedside is the one that's coming in contact with the patient, actually seeing what's going on with the patient. We have no idea what going forward would look like with um, COVID. We're taking it day by day. I mean, everybody's lives were completely overturned, be it going on a walk outside, be it getting groceries, be it getting meeting a friend, be it anything. Every single aspect of our life, from living at home to working to socializing to having fun, was absolutely and completely disrupted um, and changed in a matter of hours to days. And it's continued to be so. And the mental health repercussions of that are something that I don't think anybody can even understand. And it's something that we have to really work on talking about. We have to be support systems for, for um, each other. Mm -hmm.